look, thank you very much, everyone, for taking the time to uh, join us this afternoon um, in another one of our, our webinars that we're running through our pilot safety campaign um, at CASA, and we're running this around, uh, around the country. My name's Tim Penny. I'm an aviation safety advisor, and I work for CASA uh, out of the Melbourne office. And um, I've been running a number of these webinars over the last few months. So um, it's good to see those of you that uh, have come back to join us once more. And for those of you joining us for the first time, welcome along. It's, uh, it's certainly good to have you. And uh, we are thrilled today to be able to have a guest speaker uh, with us, um, Phil Remilton. Um, Philip's a senior base pilot with the RFDS, the Royal Flying Doctor Service, and Phil's based in the uh, South Australian Northern Territory region, uh, based out of Adelaide. And I'll flick across to Phil in a, in a short while. So before we get underway, I'll just do a, a, a few kind of welcome and housekeeping uh, bits and pieces. Um, First of all, thank you so much for, for uh, making the effort to join us. Uh, we want this webinar to be a, a short, sharp webinar. We certainly understand that people's time is, is precious. And of course, everyone's attention spans are somewhat limited in the online environment anyway. We want this webinar to be as useful as possible to everyone joining us today. Um, the purpose of this webinar is to, to help all of us to think and manage the numerous hazards and things that we have to consider when operating in the non-controlled environment, that is non-controlled um, airspace and around and in the vicinity of non-controlled airports. Um, we're certainly once again grateful to Phil for joining us today. Um, although based in Adelaide, um, Phil spends the majority of, of his time, or much of his time, of course, in uncontrolled airspace and flying into and out of uncontrolled airfields. So his experience today will be certainly invaluable to us all. We do have some large numbers with us today, as we do on most of our webinars. So um, Jenna, who's working in the background, um, has uh, muted muted everyone for the time being and turned um, cameras off, etc. It just um, allows the presenters to be uh, to operate in a in a way that we don't get distracted. So we certainly do appreciate that. Um, we will be recording the webinar and this webinar will be put up on our CASA website in the Pilot Safety Hub um, within 24 hours or so of, uh, of today, just so people can go back and have a look at that webinar at their leisure. And uh, finally, um, if you look on the top of your screen in Teams, you'll see a little chat bubble. If you click on that chat bubble, a little window will open on the right hand side. And as we progress through the through the webinar, feel free to just type in questions or comments as we go. And we'll collate those and answer them as required and, and as we proceed through. And if we have time at the end, we'll certainly try and answer as many of those comments or questions as we can. Anything we can't get to, then of course, we will get back to you um, through your email address, et cetera, that you use to register and uh, we'll close the loop uh, that way. It's our intention to have all of this really done and dusted as much as possible within about within about 45 minutes or so, but certainly less than an hour. So the way it's all going to run, our agenda today um, is uh, I'll give a short overview of the topic, um, operations in the non-controlled environment, just with a few key points that we are wanting to try and emphasise throughout the next 45 minutes or so, and just to get people thinking. Then I'll hand over to really our, the majority of our presentation to our guest speaker, Philip Remilton from RFDS uh, based in Adelaide. And I'm sure you will find uh, Phil's presentation most interesting and a really good and invaluable insight into the work that the RFDS does and the challenges faced by their pilots on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, then I'll just wrap up with a few final key points and speak specifically on uh, the use of various frequencies in the non-controlled environment. Um, and all being well, we will have some time at the end for some questions and discussion, of course, and then we'll wrap it up and uh, you should be, we should be done um, within the hour. So that's kind of the a bit of the roadmap as to, as to where we're going with all this. So just with regards to kind of setting the scene, a bit of an overview, one of the things we, we need to keep in mind all the time when we're talking about non-controlled 
the non-controlled environment is that non-controlled airspace provides us as aviators with immense freedoms compared to, I suppose, uh, what exists in much of uh, Western Europe and, and even the USA. In Australia, we have considerable freedom to basically fly wherever we want away from the restrictions of controlled and restricted airspace. And it's really only a relatively small proportion of uh, Australia's airspace below flight level 245 um, that is actually controlled, especially for the VFR pilot. So we do have a lot of freedom. The second point I want to make is that, of course, non-controlled airspace does not enjoy the enhanced levels of safety um, that ATC provides in the controlled environment. But because of that freedom, we as pilots, of course, um, we have to accept the responsibility for collision avoidance. As pilots in command, we have to therefore develop that mental model of where we are in relation to everyone else and get that right in our heads. Um, of course, the non-controlled aerodrome environment can be a very hazardous, rich environment um, because that's where aircraft invariably come together um, in the non-controlled world and the and hazard and risk of, of course increases. So developing and maintaining things like our situational awareness and following standard procedures, they take on a whole new importance in this environment. And safety in the non-controlled world requires really two major things, an understanding of the hazards that we're facing and also being judicious and very disciplined with our risk management. Um, and also an understanding of the tools that we have at our disposal to try and mitigate the risks that these hazards represent. And really what better way to learn about some of these hazards uh, in the real world and how to manage them with our, with our guest presenter, um, Phil from um, RFDS. So just to, just to wind up my, my, short, uh, my short little bit of the overview, you know, to get this in proportion, I suppose, is to, I suppose, just realise there are about 300 non-controlled certified airports in Australia, and there are thousands of more uncertified airports, and they all have their own unique, you know, characteristics um, that we as pilots, of course, have to deal with. And non-controlled airports and the non-controlled airspace around these, these airfields they certainly are an extremely fluid and a very, very dynamic environment. There are so many variables that we have to contend with. There's big variations in, in, in pilot experience of pilots flying into and out of these places, aircraft performance, departure and approach profiles, traffic mix and all sorts of things. So it's a very, very fluid environment. Doing it safely, in this type of world relies very heavily on us following standard procedures and being disciplined with our planning. And Phil is going to speak specifically about all the effort that RFDS go into with planning when they go and do these types of operations in this airspace. That's going to go a long way to providing us with the levels of safety that we need, but also what other people sharing the airspace with us as well, they deserve too. It does require discipline, and it certainly does require commitment on behalf of us as pilots in command to do this properly. Please be aware though, that we, with the significant freedoms that you know, non-controlled airspace provides, you are never, ever, ever going to get a perfect silver bullet, 100% guarantee of 100% safety all the time. Okay. So we are operating in an environment where there are hazards and there is risk, but we're not here today to teach people how to operate in the non-controlled world, but to hopefully leave with you an emphasis on about the importance of understanding what those hazards are and what we can do to mitigate risk. That's probably the, the, the big thing that we'd like people to take away from our webinar. We don't want to be pilots that are just winging it. We want to be pilots that are really thinking about our flying and understanding the hazards and managing the risks that we face. So that's just a bit of an overview as to where we're traveling with, with the seminar and the types of things that we're going to try and look at. But um, it would be, um, it would be a, a good time now to perhaps hand over the reins to Phil and I'll just stop sharing my presentation and then I'll ask Phil if he can put up his presentation.
There's Phil in Adelaide, and hopefully everyone can see Phil's title slide. And without any further ado, if you're happy, Phil, I will pass the baton over to you. Cool. So uh, initially, uh, I'm presenting today from uh, Ghana country in uh, Adelaide, and the RFTS would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of country uh, throughout Australia and recognise their continuing con connection to land, waters and community. And we'd like to pay our respects to them, their cultures, elders, past, present and emerging. A uh, quick rundown of uh, my presentation before we give it back to uh, Tim. Um, firstly, who am I? What do I do at the RFTS? And then running through how RFTS taskings are sort of given to the pilot group and then considerations I would take pre-departure and on task. And the questions will come after uh, Tim's wrapped it up at the end. Uh, I'm senior base pilot for RFTS SANT, been here for about 15 years um, and look after the South Australian operation pilot wise and operate Pilatus PC-12 aircraft, um, mainly on aeromedical, but also some passenger transport operations we do. Got a few RFTS slides just quickly. Uh, it's the purpose is to make healthier and happy Australians uh, wherever we can find them. So around about in Australia, the RFDS interacts with someone around about every two minutes across the country. And for SANT, that equates to about one every 10 minutes with uh, our section of the uh, country. Uh, we see a lot of patients each year for a variety of uh, different reasons, as you can see from those numbers across the bottom of the screen. Um, it's not all everyone getting put in an aircraft, but do a lot of primary health care, oral health, Mental health immunisations went really high with uh, COVID. The digital world's growing. And then uh, there's also a, a road component that uh, also happens. Probably the most interesting one out of that to me is the amount of medical chests uh, that are under RFTS management, which provides people travelling and living in the outback when they've got access to one, a method of uh, talking to a doctor and getting uh, access to drugs and the like that would not normally be available. Uh, just a snapshot of one day in the RFTS. Uh, that's uh, what we got up to uh, in the map on the right hand side. And uh, just the general area we fly across with in Australia with two points, sorry, SANT, 20 aircraft, four bases, and about 9,000 evacuations a year. Alrighty, we have a uh, Operator Control Centre, or OCC as I'll refer to it, in uh, Port Augusta, and uh, they basically coordinate all correspondence we get as pilots for tasking reasons. We use a phone system called Whisper to uh, get the messages from the OCC to the pilot group, and uh, that has two parts to it. One is a phone call, which uh, is automated and you need to push a couple of buttons when it comes through to justify that you, you got the message. And it's really good because if you get the buttons in the wrong order, you'll get another phone call three minutes later with the uh, same thing. It also sends you an SMS, which uh, then has the details of the tasking. It'll tell us what time is planned doors closed. It'll tell us what aircraft, It'll tell us uh, where we're going and the priority of the tasking. Once we've got all that data, we then need to uh, go and check the weather. So we've got the graphical forecast, we've got the terminal forecast, we've got the GPWTs and the SIG weather charts to uh, have a bit of look at what the uh, general state across the area we're going to operate in is and what we may need to avoid where necessary. Um, also get the NOTAM. So when you get your briefing, the airfield NOTAMs and the head office NOTAMs, provided you know, tick the right box, will come up on the bottom of it and give you a read which helps us for a lot of places that are certified airports and we get data on. But obviously there's a lot of non-certified airports that then we need to add to uh, our knowledge. So as the RFTS, we operate an internal NOTAM system for airports that aren't covered by uh, the what you get off a briefing. That can be simple things like the uh, windsock might require a replacement shortly, so don't expect to find too much of one get when you get there to the fence has fallen over and we've now got a uh, wildlife hazard and airport and everything in between. So it's it's just our method of giving crews knowledge of uh, what potential issues are somewhere before they uh, 
get going and in the planning phase. So once we've determined the weather's all right, the NOTAMs are checked and there's nothing that is obviously precluding a plan on that bit, we can make a flight plan. We can take into account the year of PRDs or the prohibited risk and danger areas that we found out about during the NOTAMs, be they regularly activated or just activated by NOTAM. Um, take into account those limitations, both on the uh, airfield ones and also the RFDS ones about what we know from, it could, could be a soft wet surface or uh, wildlife Ooh. hazards from our own ones or anything like that. Probably slightly peculiar to the aeromedical world, but um, depending what uh, happens with patients in the back of the aircraft, we may or may not need to have cabin altitude requirements for how high we can fly. And more so the question for longer flights is what are we going to do if those requirements change, which then comes down to a fuel question, because generically it then burns more fuel at lower level. So then if we need it, check fuel availability and is the refuelling available uh, at the times we would get there, because Whilst a lot of things are a card swipe these days and really good and you can get things 24 seven, there are places we go where fuel availability is determined by hour of the day. Uh, once we know all that stuff, you can then do a weight and balance and uh, determine that everything you want to take can actually fit in the aeroplane and operate legally. And then once we've got a weight and balance, we can then uh, check that the performance of the aircraft will uh, fit within the parameters of the airfields we're going to. Just, Once a, we've just, determined... a, just a, sorry, Phil, just a quick one. Um, mm -hmm. We just got someone in the chat window. You were talking about those internal NOTAMs that you guys have. Yes. We, someone in the chat room said, if we are flying in the outback, is there a way we can actually, or the general public, I suppose, or the flying public, that is pilots, can view the RFDS internal NOTAMs to understand any operational issues? Obviously, it doesn't preclude the requirement to phone ahead to the aerodrome operator, but... I would assume those internal NOTAMs are just specifically for the the RFDS pilots. Yeah, it comes through a um, system that our tasking operators use in the OCC. So yeah, they, it's not uh, visible to the outside world. Yeah. Okay. That's cool. Um, yeah. No best worries. thing best thing you can do in that regard is uh, ring an airfield owner operator to um, see what the local conditions are and get it first hand knowledge. Yeah. And yeah. Make yeah, make sure. You, I suppose you also know who you're talking to because someone might say that the strip is fine. It might be fine for their Land Cruiser, but not a not a Jabiru. It uh, may be fine for a, a quad bike that they've done a strip inspection on too. But yes. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Thanks, Phil. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, that's a lot better to actually ring someone who owns it, lives there, um, and get the get the details, yeah. which still happens from our end if we haven't been somewhere for a while, OCC and or the pilot. We'll often ring the uh, the people at the airstrip and find out what's going on. Once we've done all that, I uh, need to do a risk assessment. Um, I think in the regs it's called a journey risk assessment. Uh, in RFDS land, we call it a FRAM or a flight risk assessment matrix. Runs through a, a list of things for pilots to consider and think about, um, starting off with are they mentally and physically fit? Should they be getting in an aeroplane? Um, from a decision making point of view, it's a, it's a lot easier to make a, um, a decision on are you fit well before you end up strapped in a seatbelt sitting in a cockpit. If you're starting to make a decision at that point, it's probably a little bit late. It'll then look at uh, things along the lines of how long you've been doing the job. Obviously, the longer you've been doing it, the, the less um, new everything is and the easier things become. What's the weather like? Is there night operations involved in it? Is there runway lined approaches because they're safer than circling approaches? Are you going to have to do a visual night circuit into a black hole? Um, is there known wildlife hazards at the airport? And it goes goes through a whole list of those sort of things, which comes out with a number, which then gives the pilot an indication of whether they can make the decision on their own or whether they need to consult other people in the process to work out if the risk can be mitigated a bit or basically whether it becomes a, a no-go event due to the elevated risk of the operation. Which comes down to then the question of is the risk versus reward of the tasking actually acceptable, firstly to the safety of the uh, crew on the aircraft and secondly the operator in general because no one wants to have to deal with the aftermath of anything going wrong. 
So it's, it's no point risking an airframe and the crew to try and get to someone if, if it's just not going to be a desirable outcome. Yeah, Phil, you know, one of the things that we will often emphasise is that it's perfectly, it is a perfectly acceptable risk management technique to actually um, eliminate the risk and actually decide not to go. That That's entirely appropriate. Um, even uh, you know, even the medical world, if it, if the if the risks are such that you don't go, well, then you don't go. So it, that's entirely appropriate. Yeah, and I mean, it probably more so happens with weather systems and things like that as they move across, um, which would delay flights at times. Yeah. One, yeah. well, for two reasons really. One, one is you've got to fly through the weather system, and the second one is from a bit more of an aeromedical perspective, whilst you often need to get people to the patient to look after them, if you're then going to lift the patient back to a more appropriate medical facility, you just need to take a bit into account what you're actually yeah. going to fly them through and yeah. are you actually going to put do more damage to them with what you're going to operate through. So yeah. um, just things to consider. Yeah, a couple of questions that have just come in while you were chatting mm -hmm. there, Phil. Um, has there been a case where you have ever decided that you aren't fit to fly yourself? Have you made the call for yourself due to physical uh, yeah. or mental? Generally around um, fatigue towards particularly the ends of night shifts. Um, yep. They'd start deciding whether you you really should still be operating. Um, yep. you've, you've got to, unfortunately, we operate in a single pilot environment, so we don't have someone sitting next to us that can yeah. provide that second set of eyes looking at us. So. Yeah. Personally, I take the opportunity once I've loaded everyone in an aircraft to go and walk around the aircraft one more time. Firstly, for checking that you've actually shut everything. But secondly, it gives you that 20, 30 seconds to actually ask yourself, should you be climbing back into the aeroplane? Yeah, no, it's good. Um, and Andrew put through forward a question. How much time does a pilot have from the moment um, they have to start planning to take off. So if it's a if it's an urgent call, do you have like a, a 15, 20 minute window or something like that to get airborne? Uh, we've got a 45 minute window currently okay. in our, our tasking guidelines. All right. And um, Mark texted in. Um, when when you talk about these 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 risk assessments, I suppose depending on the severity of the risk, who owns that risk decision? Does it go all the way to the is it senior base or the chief pilot or who actually owns the risk decision? Uh, if it comes back on our frame form uh, below a level, the, the pilot makes the decision. Yep. Um, if it comes back in a sort of a mid range, if we call it that, uh, they'll defer to the uh, management pilot, be it senior base, head of flight ops, um, training and checking to uh, assist in the decision making and look at what risk mitigators can be put into place. Okay. And if it scores, we'll call it, you know, high or red, um, it generally ends up with the same group of management pilots to assist in decision making. Is there a way to do it or accept that the task won't be going ahead at the current time? Sure, no worries. All right, I'll let you keep going, but um, keep the questions coming in and we'll get to some more in a second, but away you go, mate. Excellent. So we've got through a risk assessment, decided that it's acceptable to go. We now go and pre-flight the aircraft. Uh, obviously, as per the flight manual of the operating handbook and any company standard op procedures that exist. Um, taking into consideration where you're going and any conditions that you're going to get. So, for example, if you are going from a seal strip to a seal strip, um, relatively worn tyres may not cause a problem. If you're going from a nice seal strip to a very rough, very rocky dirt strip, you may want to consider the, the state of tyres and then get engineering to either make an assessment and or replace prior to departure. And likewise, with depending what um, deferred defects the aircraft you're flying is carrying, um, based on the conditions of the day, you may or may not want to accept the aircraft, uh, depending on what's not functioning within it. Then we get to go flying. That's the good bit. Yeah, now the fun begins. So I'm not going to talk much about the departure at all because I'm I'm doing this from the lens of me operating from Adelaide to somewhere. But uh, once you're up in cruise flying along and uh, what I'd sort of call the low activity environment most of the time sitting up there in cruise, 
start thinking about the uh, destination that you're going to arrive at. So obviously you've got a forecast, so you've got some expected met conditions for your arrival, be it a nice cavalcade day like I've pretty much got out my window today or something where we can expect at some places to do instrument approaches towards minimas. So you've got an idea of what to expect. Then we can have a little look at what obstacles exist around airports, um, be them towers, um, any high trees, um, random cranes that are left on airports, um, any of that sort of stuff. Also, what hazards exist at the airport? So you'll go to some non-controlled airports that are really good. They've got camel proof fences, they're sealed, they're secure basically, um, so you won't get too much running across it right down to the ones that are in the middle of a, a cattle paddock where they are uh, got roaming livestock and who knows what farm equipment's been left up to the edge of it and all that sort of thing. Instrument approaches exist at some places, so you may or may not wish to use them. Um, like I said earlier, a runway aligned approach has been proven as safer than a circling arrival. So depending what uh, aircraft you're flying them, uh, how you're operating that may or may not be a, a usable function. Um, probably a lot more so at night when you've lost the uh, a lot of the visual. What, what, so again, sorry, what runways you've got? Um, are they sealed? Are they unsealed, natural? More so towards has there been rain events? Therefore, are the unsealed ones still usable? Um, which then comes to performance limitations. Can you or can't you still use them based on now what we know about the airport? So based on wind, based on temperature, slope, um, is it sealed or not sealed in the performance of the particular aircraft you're operating? They, uh, runways may or may not be usable, particularly when you've applied uh, factoring to those uh, performance numbers. With all those thoughts, you can then make a bit of a plan for your arrival. Are you going to do an instrument approach on arrival? Are you going to come in and join overhead or on a downwind or on a base? What sort of would be an, an arrival plan that you would make at this point in time when we don't know about traffic? Yeah, one of the things that comes through in all of this, Phil, is the amount of attention to detail that goes into planning. Um, there's some really good lessons for, for all of the people joining today. Um, it, the, the, the the robust planning that that it, that actually goes into these flights is, is quite extraordinary. You don't just kick the tires and light the fires. Yeah, and I mean we're we're lucky enough. Generally, we operate into a lot of the areas regularly. Um, yep. So local knowledge is a really good thing. Um, yeah. When you go and operate somewhere where you don't operate all the time, it becomes a lot harder, and you spend a lot more time reading documents in flight to um, yeah. get that as close to local knowledge as you can get. Okay. And then we get to uh, being on descent. Obviously, once you start descending, you need to know where your lower safe altitude is, MSA, MDA, uh, depending what sort of uh, arrival you're planning on. And at what time we need to be a lot more vigilant because we're now below a safe altitude. Uh, we're lucky enough to operate IFR generally all the time. So air traffic control is going to give us known IFR traffic basically at or before top of descent and then update if anything changes on the way down, which starts to give us a traffic picture of what we can expect on arrival at this airport. What that doesn't give us at this point in time is unknown IFR traffic. So traffic that is either taxing and hasn't talked to a centre or IFR traffic that is on a start time for departure that is going to pop up at some point, but we don't know when, and VFR traffic which is cool because we're still top of the sand, we're still a fair way up. Do you um, make use of, do you make use of um, HF a lot? Yeah, all the aircraft have got HF in it and a lot of airports we go to, you can't get uh, yeah. ATC by VHF on the ground. So it's it's HF communication and then just general broadcasts on the, on the centre frequency. Yeah, and as IFR, you have to be in continuous comms. Correct, yeah. So basically radio communication, and if you've got two uh, VHFs, one on centre, one on CTAF, and uh, hopefully we'll pick up uh, as much of the traffic as we can that's talking in the local area. Um, while we're on the set, if there's a way to get some current weather, 
uh, always a good idea, be it through a, an AWIB and AWIS. Um, if you can't get them in the aeroplane, maybe Centre can help you out and uh, get you the latest meta. Uh, just something to give you a bit of an indication if anything's changed, particularly if uh, weather systems are moving through and that's uh, caused a variation. Which then leads to the question of performance limitations, more so around rainfall at this point in time, because that may or may not get soft wet surfaces out of unsealed runways and uh, change the wet dry characteristic of um, performance data, which then you can consider whether all runways are still available or whether you're now limited to um, a, a selection of what's there if there's options. Uh, we can also start looking at tra what traffic density we're starting to get, whether we've got a lot of known IFR traffic or are we going somewhere where there's a no lot of known uh, flight training activity. It's one of the destinations that they use for you know, more remote circuit training from uh, training airports. Is it a weekend and there'll be a lot of gliders out? Um, all that sort of thing to uh, consider what we're going to find when we get there. And also consider how we're going to cancel a SAR on arrival. So is it somewhere where we've got VHF on the ground? Is it somewhere we're going to use HF? Is, you know, are you carrying a sat phone as a backup plan if cell phones don't work? Just what option are you contemplating using so people don't come looking for you? We then get towards approaching the circuit. So generically, we'll make an inbound call at around about 30 miles. Um, that's as we're pretty much coming down through transition, which is seven to 10 minutes out, and be forming more of a situational picture of what's going on at this time with the inbound call on the CTAF. Hopefully anyone that's operating within that area will uh, be talking to us, and we can add that traffic that we're finding out about to the picture of the known IFR traffic to, to see where that's sitting. Um, a lot of all I'd say at about this point is be predictable. Um, love it when people talk to us it's great and as Tim was saying standard phraseology is brilliant but any comms is good um, keep it simple keep it clear and it'll work we've had um, fun over the years I guess with it, we make an inbound call and it's great you know we're here to share the sky with everyone else but you know some people are oh, I'll get out of your way that's nice and if we're in a hurry thank you but it needs to happen in a predictable manner so we can understand where everyone's going. If everyone's on a inbound towards a single point at an airport, um, we sort of know where everyone's going. As soon as you deviate from that concept, you sort of kind of really need to know where everyone's going because it, it can be a bit all over the place. So as we've got this picture, you can now make a plan on how to integrate with uh, known traffic. And uh, TCAS and ADSB come in very useful at this point in time as well because it gives you a pictorial reference of where traffic is uh, to confirm I guess what you've built as a mental model with what you've been told on the radio and then a lot of the time more so if traffic is entering or leaving the circuit as opposed to just doing circuits um, radio calls to confirm where they are what altitude they're climbing through if you've got a conflicting inbound and outbound track, is there some uh, unique ground feature you can use if everyone's visual to uh, separate yourself so you know people are on opposite sides of things? And just anything to keep it simple. I mean, I, I used some uh, grain ships in the Gulf or Spencer Gulf the other day to separate myself from a Q-Link Dash 8. So it's, you know, just pick something that's really obvious and then it's pretty hard to get it wrong. And last but not least, you've got to go back to the first concept and use see and avoid because it's non-controlled airspace. While it's nice for everyone to have a radio, not everyone has. And see and avoid is the uh, last option for finding the unknown traffic. Just a quick question from me, Phil. Um, yep. what, in the PC-12, what is the typical speed that you will come down the slope from about 10,000 feet? And what, what what's your... If you're doing, if you're joining the circuit in any way, what what's your typical downwind speed? Uh, downwind is normally somewhere oh, 120, 150 knots. Um, okay, so you'll be at a thousand AGL. Uh, 1500. 1500. Okay. Yeah. So it's um, we're we're pretty lucky in a PC12. They're very versatile. 
So, I mean, typical descents around the 220 indicated. And if you want to slow it down to 100, you can quite easily. Um, yep. Once you start getting flat out, you can slow down more. So you can fit we, in. We can confirm, conform with a lot of what's in the traffic pattern. All right. No worries. There are a few questions um, in the chat, but we'll just let you go through your Prezo, mate, and then we can grab those after. So that'd so be easy. Uh, once we approach the circuit area, um, you're back to hopefully we're having worked out where the, the pattern or the traffic in the pattern is sitting, and then we're down to see and avoid. We, we should have a good mental model and assisted by TCAS and ADSB where appropriate to have a pretty good idea where everything is. And then it's down to integrating with anyone that's um, in there. So we don't own the sky. It's really nice if if people help us out, particularly if we're in a hurry on a medivac flight. But a lot of the time we're not, and um, we just need to work with everyone to, to make it work. See and avoid obviously is, you know, at this, at this point you need to be looking outside. It's, it's if you haven't got that bit, everything inside sorted, um, you probably shouldn't be in the circuit area. Clear communication with everyone that's outside, obviously in the area. Um, there is standard phraseology, obviously, but just talk. I mean, I know as you know, everyone's been a student pilot at some point, and you know, you don't want to talk to the big scary guy and something else. But we're all human, and just say good day. Um, we're going to fit into whatever the current uh, traffic pattern is. Like it, we we're just talking about, we're pretty versatile on speed to try and make it work with whatever's there, and fly a predictable pattern. It's when when things happen out of the ordinary, it becomes a lot more interesting. And lastly, and more so probably for IFR pilots talking to um, VFR guys that don't fly IFR, if you call inbound and you say I'm passing the final approach fix probably isn't going to mean too much to VFR traffic. So you pretty got much got to know your crowd you're talking to. And saying you're passing the final approach fix five mile final for whatever runway is going to make a lot more sense than just leaving it as a final approach fix. And uh, that's what I had. So I'll hand it back to you, Tim. No, look, that's awesome. Thank you so much. Just a couple of things I want to talk about before we um, open up the, the Q&A just on frequency use. When we, are, um, when we are running a lot of our seminars and talking to pilots all over the country, non-controlled airspace, there seems to be, uh, there seems to be some type of confusion about, about 1267 versus area frequency versus published CTAF. I just want to try and clarify that a bit now that we've got an audience of about 150 watching um our, our webinar uh and this is essentially straight from aip bearing in mind that in the uncontrolled environment there is no silver bullet 100 percent set of rules that's going to guarantee 100 percent safety 100 percent of the time if we want to as pilots enjoy the freedoms of flying in an uncontrolled uh, world well then there are additional hazards and risks that we all have to accept when we go and do that so just briefly Frequency use for non-controlled airspace. Here's essentially what the what the rules say. Um, if you're in the vicinity of an aerodrome that's published on an aeronautical chart, okay, um, paper charts, Avplan, Oz Runways, Jefferson, whatever, you use the published CTAF if you're in the vicinity of that aerodrome, or if there is no actual published CTAF for it, the fault one two six seven. If you're within a broadcast area, now broadcast areas basically lump a whole heap of non-controlled airfields into one, I suppose you could say, common CTAF. They're quite common up in the northern parts of Australia, especially around some of the tourist areas. If you're within a broadcast area, then use the dedicated broadcast area CTAF. But probably the one uh, issue that causes a, a, a perhaps the most consternation or at least debate among among pilots is if you are in the vicinity of an aerodrome that isn't published on air, any aeronautical chart. It might be something like, you know, uh, Fred's Farm or something like that. It's recommended that pilots in that instance use the area VHF frequency. Um, but please be aware, and I'll talk about this in a sec, 
that air services do not monitor 1267. Air services do not listen to CTAFs. It's the only the area frequency that you will get the advice and assistance that you require from, from air traffic. So just to reiterate that point, and all of that, by the way, is found in AIP. You can see it there, AIP en route, 1.151, para 916. So if you are in the vicinity of an uncharted aerodrome, essentially use the most appropriate frequency. And that decision ultimately rests on the shoulders of the pilot in command. And in some respects, it may be 1267. But be aware, of course, if you are operating in the vicinity of an uncharted airfield, any aircraft that might be transiting should, of course, be monitoring the area frequency. So what does AIP say? Well, this is basically taken straight from AIP. In the vicinity of uncharted aerodromes, pilots have discretion to use the most appropriate frequency that ensures safe operation. And it well may be 1267. But pilots need to be aware that transiting aircraft that might not know about Fred's farm, for example, they should be on area VHF. To ensure mutual traffic awareness, it's recommended that pilots using an alternative frequency at least also monitor area. There are so many variables in the uncontrolled world, um, in uncontrolled airspace, and there will have to be times when pilots do have to make the best risk-based decision they can with the information, of course, that they have available to them at the time. And sometimes this just might be frequency selection. So now that I've kind of got off my soapbox with that one, um, just to wrap up um, before we go into questions, please be aware that um, there is no ATC control service um, in uncontrolled airspace. In, a, in many respects, it's probably the biggest hazard that we face. There's no ATC control service that's going to provide separation or sequencing. Second thing, you are the pilot in command, so make decisions and use the best possible information that you can get your hands on. And one of the things that Phil talked about especially was the really robust planning process they, they went into when venturing out into the wide world of uh, uncontrolled airspace. And we do this by being disciplined in our preparation. Prepare, prepare, prepare. Because no two non-controlled airports or pieces of non-controlled airspace are often the same. We really need to be disciplined with our preparation. Standard procedures. By following standard procedures in and around the circuit, for example, it makes our flying predictable. There's nothing more disconcerting than seeing an aircraft doing something that is completely out of the ordinary. And they do go a long, a long way to increasing levels of safety. They provide an orderly way of doing things. Standard procedures aren't there to make our lives a misery. It's to provide at least some order in the non-controlled environment. So ask yourself before you go flying, and also while you are in the air, but especially beforehand, what can come and bite me? What are some of the hazards that are likely to impact my flight? And how am I going to manage the risks that they, that they represent? You know, we do have a lot of tools at our disposal to manage those risks. It could be following standard procedures. It could be knowing your aircraft performance, appropriate use of technology, managing your fatigue, managing distractions, look out, all of those types of things. So at this point, I'd just like to say thank you to Phil for his time and his expertise. And we do have a few minutes left, if you're happy to hang around, just to go through some of the things that have come through on the chat, if you don't mind, Phil. Um, 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 Rob did an earlier question talking about the risk management. If you have an extra task that comes on you in flight, um, Phil, that diverts you from your current tasking, how can you obtain the information for to do a, a risk assessment? Do you do like an in-flight risk assessment that you plug into any type of matrix? Um, how do you do? How do you go about that very briefly if something comes out of the blue while you're airborne? It uh, becomes a, a diversion question, really. One way of work out from an aviation perspective, can you do the flight um, change? We've got an EFB that we use, and I guess shameless plug, Oz Runways, yep. um, which works really well in the background. It gives us a document library where we can, we've uploaded all our manuals, so everything a pilot should need should be sitting in the background, which yep. they can refer to. Yep. Um, we get a, the diversion would have come through the operation control center. So we've got 
knowledge of the NOTAM system that would be passed on from um, our OCC people. Yeah. And we can also ask them to ring people to do some of the job for us mm -hmm. and get back to us. So yep. we are lucky enough that we can hand off a lot of the planning or questioning side of it to them so we can focus on the flying of the aeroplane. Yeah, so you can hand off a lot of that stuff. So we, we, good, we can, we, good support yeah. network. Yeah, we can ask them to ring the ARO or airport owner to get any details that we want. Um, we can get them to organise fuel if we need it. We can yep. get them to organise the, the ambulance service to help us out if there is one or what volunteers are going to help us out. We, we can handball a lot of things that um, if they weren't sitting there behind us, yeah. um, we, you'd have to do yourself while you're also trying to plan a diversion and to yeah. fly the aircraft. Yeah, no, especially important in a high workload situation like single pilot IFR. Um, Noel just texted in earlier. Um, for example, the on-call aerodrome reporting officer can be very useful. They can provide real-time advice before the arrival of the aircraft. And I'm sure you can plug that stuff into your decision-making process. Um, AROs can also do a wildlife inspection before you get there. So that's also another very useful resource. Um, here's a question. Does RFDS also carry FLAM? um that that no. to for greater glider visibility no we don't um everything's got a tcas um yep. depending on what era the pc12 some of them have got adsb in they've all got adsb out yep uh, no. but no no flum okay no that probably answers james's question which is following that uh, rfds aircraft equipped with any sort of adsb in and you said uh, the the that's going slowly going through the fleet yeah, it just depends what, what iteration of a PC-12 it was, whether it was part of it or not. Okay. Um, Josh, how much communication is done with the aerodrome operations people on the ground when on arrival at a non-certified aerodrome? I think we've pretty well we've pretty well answered that. You can make contact with the ARO and station owners and things like that. Yeah, and we look, have all, had... All yeah, ours go have ahead. got a UHF radio also in the audio nice. panel, so... Um, Yep. We can have a chat to people on the ground, more so around yep. the wildlife inspections and all that sort of thing on arrival. Yeah, and look, we've had also a couple of questions, Phil, or comments slash questions from people, I suppose, young pilots starting out in their career, looking perhaps to go down the RFDS road. Um, I know in our earlier conversation yesterday, you said that like a lot of operators, you're, you know, you're always on the lookout for pilots and, you know, um, and uh, any any hints and tips for pilots who may want to throw their resume in? What the type of things you're looking for? Um, well, I don't know. Based on a lot of what I see, if you've got opportunity to acquire night hours, please take the opportunity if you do want to come and work for the RFDS. Night um, hours. Ge generically, 2,000 hours total and 200 hours night um, is a good starting point. Yeah, and do you have aptitude tests and all the rest of it through the process? Uh, we don't at the moment, but uh, okay. it's an interview, interview process. Um, okay. But yeah. All right. Um, and what else? A lot of other people have put in comments and things that we've sort of addressed. Um, uh, thank you, Phil. Very insightful. Uh, da, 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 oh, we've got someone. This is this is Rebecca out at Marla RFDS Clinic. So good on you, Beck. Very informative to hear what's involved from a pilot's point of view when preparing and carrying out a flyout. Yeah, all the best um, out there, Beck. Um, I'm glad the I'm glad the internet's working for you. Um, good sessions and all the rest of it. Lovely. Um, just a shameless plug on my behalf when we to, to just kind of finish. Um, as we said at the outset, this presentation will be made available uh, on our Pilot Safety Hub in the next 24 hours or so. So please feel free to jump in and, um, and have a look. Um, our Pilot Safety Hub is a great place to go for all sorts of resources. Other topics include operations in the controlled aerodrome environment, flight planning, weather and forecasting that we will continue to go through as the year progresses. There's videos, podcasts, interviews, checklists, all sorts of other good information. It's our intention to run another webinar on this topic with regards to 
the non-controlled environment. If there's any particular topic or issue in the non-controlled world that you would like to see us address, just whack it in the chat in the few minutes we have left. We're always on the lookout for audience participation that way. We want to try and make these webinars as useful as possible and to get them done and dusted in under an hour so people can get some short, sharp information and hopefully apply some of these lessons and the experience that we've had from Phil to their own flying. I think that's just about it. I'll just check the last of the messages. Um, thank you, gentlemen, all very good, all very good, all very good. And um, look, I think that's just about it. We're getting a few little rounds of applause. Um, it, ain't the, it ain't the be all and end all, but hopefully we've taken out uh, away today just a little bit more information for when we are next operating in the, uh, the non-controlled environment. So thanks, Phil, on behalf of us, really great presentation. And uh, be on the lookout for our next webinar uh, in the next number of weeks. And uh, we look forward to seeing you joining us then. All the best.